All right, welcome to the Curious Builder Podcast. I'm Mark Williams, your host, and today I've got Chase Hicks with Concrete Science. Welcome, Chase. Yeah, thank you. Nice to meet you again, Mark. All right. Well, uh, for those that don't know you, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Concrete Science? I know we met uh, probably, what, four years ago? We've yep. worked on probably five or six projects now. Yep. And uh, I do think you have, by the way, one of the coolest logos uh, in the business. If you have not seen it, check it out at uh, ConcreteScience.com. And it's this really cool test tube beaker with little bubbles in it, yep. but it just really makes it makes concrete coatings and all the stuff we're going to talk about seem very cool and scientific. Yep, fun, artistic, things like that. Yeah, and, and we used to have an old logo in the 90s, and then there was a newer rendition of it. And like, so we still have some of our old marketing stuff. And But my dad's very like passionate about the logo and the branding and things like that, colors, you know, et cetera. But yeah, so like we started as a concrete company, mainly doing structural foundation work in the 70s. Early 2000s, late 90s, concrete science uh, started doing concrete cleaning and sealing, and we're just kind of doing a plethora of indoor, still concrete, still structural, but kind of multi multifaceted, I guess you could say. Different mm -hmm. different departments do different things, and so it's it's been really good. Um, as you know, you know, home building. I mean, there's a niche for you know high end flooring finishes, but someone's also still got to pour the foundations and the walls and the floors. And so we're, we're lucky to be able to do kind of all the pieces involved. So yeah, that's interesting. Cause when I first met you, it was for microtops on yep. a past client's home. Yep. And uh, I think by reputation, I'd heard of you before as well. Cause you guys did the U S bank stadium. Is that right? Or am I wrong on that? Nope. So I believe U S bank was union, uh, a lot of polishing, a lot of flake work. I still remember that project, but uh, we did a polish on that one, polish in the basement, microtop on the upper okay. level. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But not a lot of people do the microtop. And it's just kind of this small circle of guys that have whether done the training through Bowmanite or Ardex or whatever, but yeah, neat floors and there's only like a few guys that do them and kind of lucky to have a guy that knows how to do it and trained our other employees up. But okay, yeah, I mean, just a lot of kind of high end decorative floor finishes and it's kind of our specialty, especially with homes like what you guys build. You right. Know? That's right. So, I mean, a lot of it's connections because even now, five years later, let's say from our first connection point, mm -hmm. it was only recently that I even knew mm -hmm. that you did foundations and flat work yep. because yeah. I came to you looking for your specialty work yep. and then never really either wasn't listening or wasn't asking the right questions. Plus that was a remodel. So there was yep. no foundation work on that project anyway. Yep. Um, it's, it's very common. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like the apartments, uh, foundation, the flat work, the walls, it's like, it's my uncle, but it's like that division is so far removed from like the customer base from our other pieces that I'll talk to people all the time. Like, I didn't know you did that. Oh, you guys do patios, you do driveways, you know, and on and on. And, and everyone has good concrete guys. And so a lot of people will just use their people. But, you know, last couple of years, I know a lot of uh, home builders and a lot of, you know, construction companies are branching out, you know, using other companies because they're so busy or you're, you're backed up or you're behind schedule. And so it's, it's really been good these last five years with us just networking and, you know, letting people know we do different things. So not just concrete, you know, people are like, you do epoxy garage floors, you're concrete science. Like that didn't resonate, you know? Sure. So, yeah. But. Which is funny because that was one of my questions later is like, Everyone has a concrete coating guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, painters do it. You can do it yourself. I mean, it seems yep. like that uh, the barrier to entry to that particular part of the market seems pretty low, right? Yep. I mean, with the right products, and obviously you need the knowledge, and you would obviously be able to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. You guys have a much deeper knowledge base than most people, let's say, if they were just starting out. Yep. But I feel like, I mean, I've had a number of homeowners that are like, oh, I've epoxied my own floor before. Yep, and DIY. Like, yep. yep. We, and so we, we remove a lot of them. <laughs> and, and I always joke with the homeowner, too. I'm like, hey, like, did you do this one yourself? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, how was it? They're like... You know, I probably wouldn't do it again, you know, so, yep. but that's, that's a lot of things too. It's like, you can paint your own walls, you can do your own trim, but you can hire someone to do it and kind of depends on what your quality threshold is. So, yep. yeah. So, so, uh, you'd mentioned, was it your grandpa? Yep. So um, started the company. Yep. Carrie still works for us. So it, does he really? Yeah. It's actually our 50 year anniversary, if you will, cause it was started in 1970. And so he was from Black Duck, and he's told me the story like a hundred times. Is Black Duck a town? Yeah, it's like northern Minnesota. I think it's up by, it's like on your way to, it's on your way to Bemidji, Bemidji but small okay. town. So sure. he started out as a mason, tending block, and then he started his own company, basically just doing, I think they were doing like basement, you know, foundations, like small stuff like that. And then um, Hicks Concrete was the original name, and we do a lot of commercial block walls. We do a lot of work for Frana. Uh, we were union back then. A lot of floors, a lot of footings, and that was like my grandpa's passion. But when he brought my dad and uncle aboard, it was kind of like my dad viewed it as we we're sort of capped out as, you know, you can only do so much with your, your 15 guys, commercial concrete work. You wouldn't get paid for three, four months. And so it was just a grind, yeah. you know, and uh, commercial construction is a grind. And then, so that's where my dad 
really wanted to branch off with the company and do a lot more residential work because, you know, you can control your own schedule a little bit. You get down payments. You're working, you know, directly with the client or a general contractor, which is it's a lot better than, you know, relying on all these different pieces of the job. Uh, you know, he tells you stories all the time. It's like, yeah, you'd be ready to do, you know, two weeks worth of footings. They'd call you on Monday and say, hey, we got to back you up three weeks. It's like, what do you do? So being able to blend that residential work in with our commercial work was his vision. And it's really taken form probably over the last five to seven years. And having that balance and balancing the down payments with the retainage on commercial jobs and just not being cash poor all the time, which most commercial concrete companies yeah, tend to struggle with, you know? It's funny. I've got like 20 questions now. I'll try to come at you one at a time. Yep. <laughs> that, that, uh, first of all, percentage of commercial versus residential. Yep. What, uh, what's kind of your split roughly? Yep. And I got my notes here. So 66% residential, 33% commercial. So mm-hmm. like our breakdown on our, our budget basically every year is it's it's about $6 million in commercial concrete, uh, you know, 5 to 6 in residential concrete. And um and coatings is basically the rest. Um, and one thing I wanted to make note on here is that we actually, so people know us for driveways, patios, things like that, but we do probably 150 concrete pool decks a year. Really? So like we are known for pouring concrete pool decks and, and a lot of people know that, but a lot of people don't too. And so like when a lot of people know us through purely just pool decks which is not funny like i knew you from microtops but i, I mean at this point it's like anyone listening anything to do with a hard surface yeah. decorative hard surfaces <laughs> Dec- i know right yeah and well uh, foundations are not decorative nope they're not but right. they you know it's uh i'm i'm in the decorative world and i actually across the street from my son's daycare we're doing um footings and walls on a commercial apartment job and i pop over there and i'm just like is this is such a different type of work but it's you can appreciate structural natures of things because you're like this is how this whole building's built, right? Right. You know, and so I, I look at pretty things, but it's it's fun to look at the rough things sometimes too. How about so you've got the sixty six thirty three split between yep. commercial and uh, residential? What about foundation versus decorative? So let's call let's just call it basic flat work, which yep. obviously would then lead to a treatment over the top. So let's keep that out of it. Yep. So let's call it just flat work and foundation work. What what rough percentage would that be of the total work? I would say, so our commercial division is basically kind of a three-way split between your footings, your walls, and your floors. Now, then once we get to like your your decorative or your, your basically your driveways and your patios, I would say and it it's maybe a harder answer because it's like your commercial contracts are so large, but they're such tiny margins, right? So where you're decorative, it's it's not necessarily these massive concrete or massive contra- uh, contracts, but you, your higher margin work. So because yep. it's more decorative, it's specialty. It'd be like uh, equivalent of like cabinetry in a house, right? exactly. And yep. it's like you, you get the high price because it's such a high end finish. But I would say, in in the amount of time and jobs and hours, you know, I would say it's it's pretty close to a split, you know. Okay. Yeah. And, and like the manpower, I think on, you know, your your decorative concrete side, like your pool, your patio, your driveway, I think we're somewhere in the nature of thirty to thirty five guys. And that's it's basically what our commercial concrete division is too. Oh, so the big so you got around seventy guys. On on those two pieces. Yep. Yeah. And then uh we're probably Thirty in coatings at the full season, and we're about twenty in the office. So it's about one hundred twenty. That's, I mean, that's a big operation. It's fun. I know. I, I like. I always like seeing new guys, but I, I like the guys that have been with us forever. I try to remember everyone's name because yep. I feel like that can kind of, yep. you know. But yeah, having a hundred person company is never something I thought we would have. But it's, uh, it's allowed us to grow, and it's, it's, it's allowed it to be fun in the last, you know. Did you ever read? I remember I read this. I think back in college that. Um, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence Others. We were talking, me and Ian were talking about this before you came because we were talking about the business books. And I was like, what's the Carnegie book? And uh, Ian read it and I haven't read it yet, but I asked him and he's like, let me summarize it in, in five seconds for you. He's like, just don't be a dick. Hashtag <laughs> <laughs> so, truth. For those listening, Ian is our producer at yeah. Studio Americana. He's sitting in the other room laughing right now at us. Yeah. So I have it. It's on my nightstand. And uh, So yeah. I'll, here's my summary of that book. Yep, please. Um, the most important name in the English language mm-hmm. is your own. Yep. To your other uh, to other people, the point well, the reason I'm even thinking about this is yep. your comment about remembering. You, you know, you have 125 people. That's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But just in general, not only clients, but you know, people you meet. Yep. And I think you know, obviously, uh, politicians, the successful ones, mm-hmm. are ones that are very good, obviously, yeah. at remembering people's names. Yeah. And it it means something when somebody says your name. Mm-hmm. And uh, for myself, I'm very good visually, like because uh, we, we have parade homes, right? So yep. lots of people come through our parade homes, thousands. Mm-hmm. It, it's not possible for me to remember somebody's name that quickly. Mm-hmm. 
but faces. I'm very good at recognizing faces. So when you see them, so like you've seen them once and then it's like, okay, you see them again. So what do you say? You're like, hey, I remember you from this or how do you? No, it's funny. So 90% of the time this conversation goes fine. I'll yep. be like, hey, welcome back. It's great to see you again. Mm -hmm. And they'll recognize the familiarity mm -hmm. the, and if or if nothing else, like, hey, I've seen you before. It's also kind of an intro warm line of like, hey, I've seen you before. Yep. Every once in a while, maybe 5% of the time, I'll get someone that'll act like, whoa, what do you mean? We've never met before. What are you talking about? And they're like super defensive. And I'm like, I'm so Sorry, yep. uh, you know, Mr. So and so. I'm. I, my name is Mark. I'm yeah. the builder. Uh, you know, I've been doing this for 18, 19 years. Mm -hmm. I recognize a lot of people. I feel like I've seen you before. Yep. And so you try to like soft, yeah. softball it up for them a little bit. And the one percent from there yeah. will just take it another step further. They're not reading the cues. They're like, they're like, are you following me? You're a stalker. Like you're weird. Get away from me. They're worried about <laughs> like being served the subpoena. That's yeah, coming. I guess. I don't know. I'm I'm trying to break the ice here yeah. with these people. Yeah. So uh, kill them with kindness. You know, yeah. As but much anyway, as you can. the name. Anyway, name are really important and mm -hmm. uh for myself you know even on notes actually even on my session notes like mm -hmm. i know you very personally mm -hmm. but you know sometimes you get talking to someone yep. have you ever talked to someone and they literally have just told you their name oh, yeah. and then you go out and you're like i cannot remember their yep. name right now it, lately it happens a lot because like i'll try to really tune in to, that's because like, you have a two-year-old <laughs> but you're trying to tune into the conversation and be like really engaged in what they're talking about and then that's like the first thing that when you introduce yourself is the name it's just like then i've tried to kind of follow up with the get again and not be rude and like and you know i apologize but like your name again was you know and then yeah. from there i'm like if i forget it then now i'm the dick you know and i've done that before what i for me i actually yeah. write it down smart um, i always write it down on my calendar invites their yep. first name mm -hmm. i mean i've even been in meetings where i'll pretend to check my phone uh, mm -hmm. because i've literally forgotten their name and at this point i'm talking to them it's like yep. i can't not remember and yep. names are just hard for me to remember until i've had like a serious interaction mm -hmm. or like we've had either a meaningful conversation yep. or something or i can like almost like i've done little word tricks in my mind to like remember like little limericks or little rhymes yep. and then it's after that point it's like it's solid it's locked like uh, it's locked in are you good at remembering customers names like in past projects almost like where you're like oh yeah yeah that, that's where i'm like good at like if we do a job for someone like I had a furnace guy over the other day and he's like, oh, you poured my parents' drive. I was like, well, what's their last name? And he rattled it off. I was like, I remember that one, you know, like that's like, I'm good at that. But then like, you know, it, it's sort of different when you're working intimately on a project or something. You're like, I'll remember this person forever, you know? Well, and, and I think, you know, you can talk now a little bit about the duration of some of your projects. Obviously, you have a relationship with in a commercial um, program, even mm -hmm. with us as a resident, like you're often a partner of ours. Yep. You'll usually, especially in the decorative finishes, mm -hmm. would meet our clients. But like our, we have a different foundation company than yep. Concrete Science. But um, I'm, I don't think my clients have ever met any of my concrete guys out in the field. So they won't have that relationship, mm -hmm. um, which I think is kind of nice. I think you're very personable. You're mm -hmm. great with the clients. And so I think there's got to be some satisfaction in, oh, it's fun. you know, being with the actual clients in that like setting. Like the, the guy that we just worked with, I'll never forget him. So he was so cool and eclectic and like unique oh john yeah john was amazing i know so it's like i always it's fun meeting people like that and like even like my guys i'm just like you guys have such a cool job like our installers i'm like you guys get to meet all these people you get in these cool houses you get to, you know whether we're fixing stuff or doing stuff it's like it's just you, you never in any other industry and it's like it's the uniqueness and the difference and in, in type of people that we meet and that's like i always want to my weird thing is like what does that guy do you know mm -hmm. oh totally yeah and so like yeah john i remember talking about him and you told me his profession i was like you really caught me off guard but i was like kind of makes sense now right he's maybe one of the most interesting people i've ever met in my life it's it's funny. um and he actually wants to come on the podcast he's a huge fan of the podcast john if you're listening to this which i know you will yeah. i will find a way to get you on because you own a number of businesses yeah. you're a past client you're in a very interesting person so yeah. He would be an amazing person and, to have on. And even his wife, Leah, like she was an amazing person, like her passion for like oh, me and her, like she came into the office, pick up color and we talked for like an hour about horses. And it was mm -hmm. just like, it's just kind of the luxury of in our industry, you meet really fun, unique, cool people that have like cool passions in, in projects they're doing, you know? And it's also cool when they, I mean, it doesn't take much for them to talk about it. Sometimes you have to know someone for a long time before you understand what their oh, passion yeah. is. Yeah. Like it's on their sleeve. I know. I feel like, yeah, because you're, you're in their home, mm -hmm. you're working on a huge important thing for them. They kind of unravel a little bit, you know, more than just like meeting someone would. Yeah, I yeah. agree. You know, I think going back to the name and remember them, uh, you know, obviously in a build for us anyway, you yep. know, our relationship might be as short as let's call it a year mm -hmm. to three, four years. I mean, John and Lee at this point, I've known them for three years so it was yep. a year of design and two years to build yep and so i mean you're of course never gonna forget someone no, that you never. spend on a weekly basis you know especially, three years of time with especially you too because it's like those are your clients your projects you guys how many homes do you do a year not very many yeah. uh, i'd say two to four we'd like to do maybe one or two more uh it part of it depends on the scope too mm -hmm. like Big those one. were you know four million dollar homes yep. and so in the detail 
you know, if that was a different, a, a more traditional home or mm -hmm. a cottage home, I mean, you could do it in half the time probably. Yep. But that was such a Detail. unique, detailed, modern home that everything took a much, much longer, which yep. it's interesting. It's pros and cons, right? Mm -hmm. It was neat because it was a huge boost in like what we can produce yeah. and you know they trusted us and we had the chops to do it it wasn't that but it's just those homes also take i mean the wood was coming from africa <laughs> plus by the way we built this in the in the, be the beginning middle and end of covid yep. just like every other builder of course too but on yep. top of the complexities mm -hmm. you know you'd order it was just it was a lot. Yeah, I remember, you know, things taking time and then all the glass, too. I remember we were t like and my guys were talking about, too, like where the glass is coming from. And I didn't know the wood was Africa, but uh, we were up in the kitchen and I remember grabbing one of the guys and just looking around, just being like, this is just one of those houses. Like it this thing must be taken forever, you know. But well, and the and things kept changing. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, even the floor, I mean, you were part of that. I yep. mean, so, you know, we knew early on, I think that's, you know, kind of an explosion, I would imagine with the micro tops and your concrete finishes. Sure. I'd like to talk about that in a little bit. But I feel like the just I feel like our market in Minnesota is, is much more prone to go with cottage as a general mm -hmm. rule. But I do feel like there is a subset of homes, the modern, the contemporary that is is quickly taking over market share. Yep. I mean, around the country, it's, you know, a very dominant form, especially in all the magazines. Now, whether that average person does that or not is un undetermined, I guess. But it is really cool to see what you guys can do. And so having that home, I mean, that entire basement, you guys, well, you know, did your um, did I, your product on? Because what was that? That was it. That was not a micro top. No, that, that, that was metallic. But I remember Josh took a picture of it when it was done. And I was like, I don't know if you're supposed to do that. But I was like, Mark's a cool guy. But I remember looking at the picture and being like, dude, that's a badass basement. <laughs> like that. I mean, the stairs, like everything about it, the bar, like the glass windows. And I was like, this stuff you see in magazines. And it's like, we have the luxury of being a part of a a cool project like that, mm -hmm. you know? And I didn't even see the upstairs, but I was like, this place is awesome. Upstairs, well, it's, actually, you can check it out on the website. Okay, good. It's, uh, awesome. The upstairs is, is yeah. amazing. But, yeah. uh, the, I mean, the downstairs, to me, it reminds me a little bit of Tony Stark's house on the, on the Iron, Iron Man. I know, yeah. I know. And the glass and, and, like, looking out on the lake. But it's like, that's how I knew. I was like, John has got taste, man, because this place is awesome, you know? Yeah, it was, it was fun. And, yeah. I mean, seeing it from the beginning, the digital renderings with um, that interior designer. Yeah, I Randy Buffy, who's yeah. the architect yeah. and the designer, yeah. And then you see, like, you know, there, like, it looks like a video game like here this is going to look like and then seeing in the end it was, it was cool so we did some uh there's a company called dream trace and um i think uh, roseville or rosemont or, no it's not rosemont anyway in the east side of the cities mm -hmm. and uh just a neat concept you can actually send in your files and sketch up or 3d mm -hmm. and you can actually put on a like a headset and yep. a backpack and you can walk through yeah. a room it's like a i don't know two thousand feet by i don't know what the dimensions are but it's pretty big yeah and you just walk around you're actually in the model Dude, so as a thank you to that gift mm -hmm. we are to that client to john and leah we actually um, we after we're at we, this at this point usually you use that modeling to show a client before you build the house but yep. this technology to come on on board after we'd already <laughs> started building the house yep. so we actually took them through when their house was getting close to being done like yeah. or actually think at the framing stage and you know here's what your house will look like and yep. John was like wow this would have been really neat uh, cool. to do it, or you know before we even started oh, that's cool it's like a, just a tool just the technology has changed well, so and that's much something moving forward too you can use to get another super high end client like that you're like all right like check yep. this out right we actually pre-bought some hours mm -hmm. to just use up there that's awesome. uh, they also have gaming there so if we don't use it up we'll do a guy's <laughs> night and we'll just go you know yeah. play halo in a 3d environment yeah. i guess uh, i guess it's pretty cool that is neat um what on back to the to the concrete world yep Talk a little bit about the family structure of your company. So you've got obviously your grandpa, you've got your dad, you've got your uncle. Yep. I really think it's really unique. And I think a lot of people listening in other businesses, a lot of people do stem from family run businesses. Walk us a little bit through the hierarchy there. Your yep. grandpa's still working there, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the transition, sometimes working with family is hard. Sometimes it's easy. We had Mark Shear on and, you know, there, uh, you know, on episode five or episode six, I think it was of the, uh, the podcast. And he was talking just about the different brothers and responsibilities and how have you guys kind of fostered that? Is that something you knew at an early age that you wanted to be a part of? Or walk me through that evolution. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, I mean, so we've been in the same office for a long time. So like even when I was young. Like, That's in Corcoran? Yep, in Corcoran. And so I used to work in the back, like when I was like 12 and 13, just like cleaning or whatever. And like, I remember telling my dad, like, you know, I want to work here when I grow up or whatever, because everyone emulates their father, you yeah. know? And I remember him telling me like, no, like, because it was commercial <laughs> concrete. And he's just like, this is a horrible job. But, you know, it, it you know, paid the bills and, you know, we had a good life. But, um, you know, I really, you know, I think I found out that I wanted to work there probably, you know, more in college when it kind of got more decorative and I really kind of took a passion in construction. But like the, the dynamic itself, I think is great because, you know, you only have so much time, I guess, with whether it's your grandpa or your uncle or your dad or whatever. And it's really allowed me, this is me personally, and everyone maybe has a different you know perspective, but 
it's allowed me to spend so much time and energy working with my dad, working with my grandpa, seeing my uncle every day. And I just feel kind of blessed in that aspect where, you know, we get to, you know, work, be successful, do cool projects, but then collaborate. And uh, yeah, I just I kind of feel lucky to have that opportunity where um, I, I went to college out of state and I didn't see my dad for like three or four years. And it was like, you know, it's like it, it was what it was. But, you know, now, you know, even you know, having kids or whatever, you just realize how important in your life family is, mm-hmm. especially in Minnesota. It's like everyone's seemed very tight knit and everyone's very family oriented. So it's like you know, working with your family. It's like it definitely has its pros and cons. But I talk to my dad you know, five times a day, whether it's about work or it's about the kid or whatever. But it's like I felt that work has really brought us all like, super close together. Mm-hmm. And you know, I could never I could never discredit that and I could never you know, be bummed about that. And so, um, yeah, it, it's great. And then the hierarchy piece is, is is fun, too, because it's like, you know, grandpa's been doing it forever and he's seen everything and he knows everything. So it's like. We had a project that, you know, we had an issue with the other day. And I was like, have you ever seen this before? And he's like, oh, yeah. He's like, you know, down on so-and-so street and, you know, West St. Paul. He's like me. And he starts rattling off these names. This is what happened. And this is how we took care of it and whatever. So it's like, all right. So, like, that's how they did it back then. And I'll talk to my dad and, you know, ask the same question. Like, you know, what, what would you do in this situation? Or, like, how have you troubleshot this? And so from a growth standpoint, it's like you you just have so much, so many resources, you know, available to you. Right. So it's allowed me to really grow into my role faster, maybe than people that ha- maybe have mentors or bosses or things like that, where you have to tread lightly. You can't call them on seven o'clock on a on a on a Friday night, right. you know, when a project isn't going good and things like that. And uh, yeah, and honestly, my dad, he's a we're very similar. So it, like it helps like he's he's a driver. He's he's really goal oriented, a big thinker. Um you know, my grandpa, he's just a hard nose, just like worker. He, like, he, he's never not worked a day in his life. Like he started doing block and then into concrete and everyone knows commercial concrete and block guys. They're always kind of, you know, tough and kind of, you know, rusty. And, and that's him like to a T. And so just being surrounding yourself with, with people like that, I think has allowed me to just kind of get on a fast track to figuring out how this industry works and, you know, knowing what to do, what not to do, what not to say, you know, because I think sometimes people you kind of have to fall on your face with those things multiple multiple times over and over to 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 get to a position where you're you feel comfortable doing it and i feel like i've been able to skip some of those steps Mm -hmm. and that's just i mean it sounds like you've had your eyes open and i mean that yes i have questions are there other family members in your immediate family that are part of the company too you know my mom she did payroll for our company she was our secretary for 30 years um my uncle bob he's one of our decorative and commercial carpenters that does a lot of like really difficult setup. Um, it's funny, like people will come into our office sometimes. Like my, my, I don't even know. It's like my dad's second cousin, Chris. We have a masonry company and he's a salesman there. But like people will come into the office and be like, oh, I'm your third cousin. Or I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, I, you know, we stopped going to the family reunions when I was 12. But it's like, yeah, it's, you just, you meet people you're related to kind of oddly all the time, but right. you know, my mom, she's still, you know, she always talks about the old days with the company and you know, she doesn't work there anymore, but she always tells me stories and things like that. And so it's, it's fun. And I feel like it's, it's your legacy a little bit. You, know, you, you have a little bit more pride in what you do every day and you know, you never turn off the phone because it, in a sense it's your reputation, but it's, it's also, it's, it's what people know what you do, you know, mm-hmm. whether you're, you're on spring break with your family and the phone's ringing, you kind of have to answer it, you know, cause it's just part of the deal. So right. where maybe if I work for someone else, there's a little bit of separation between work and home, but I don't I regret it at all. You know, I think it's, I think as your family and your parents and people really get older in age, I think you look back on these opportunities and you can really only think, you know, how much it benefited you. Right. hundred you know? percent. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a beautiful story. I love how. I mean, how, it sounds like you guys must have really good communication habits. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my uncle and my uncle and my dad are very different. I'm like my dad. My brother's like my uncle. So, like, my brother's, like, very, like, math. He does all of our bidding for our commercial job. So, it's, like, a lot of numbers, a lot of measurements, a lot of planning. You know, my dad, it honestly, it reminds me of you where he's, like, the ultimate, like, networker. Like, he'll go into, you know, why is that a country club? And he knows everyone there. And he's just, like, you know walk down the street in YZ and he's, he's friends everywhere and he knows everyone. It's, it's so cool. And I've always looked up to that and, you know, always great reputation, very professional. He always dressed to the nine sharp, 
you know, he buys everything at Judd's, which I know is not cheap. And it's just, it's a good person to look up to. And then, you know, my grandpa, crew neck sweatshirt, penny loafers and jeans like every day, you right. know? So it's- That generation was very frugal. I know. And it's, it's just funny. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're all different, but we're all the same in a way. And I try to take little pieces from everyone. Like I, I was telling Ian- you know, before he got here, I was like, I, you know, there was a job we're on right now where I literally got screamed at by a guy and it's been, I haven't gotten yelled at in a while. And it was something that it didn't require it. And it was a little bit over the top, but, um, you know, my grandpa, he's like, you know, you know, you can call me if you ever have that problem. Cause he's like, you, you know, I don't let people talk to me that way. And then talking to my dad, he's like, yeah, sometimes you just got to take it and just listen and, you know, talk them down. And so it's like <laughs> yeah, very, very different. Totally. Uh, I know. And so, I think that's generational too, because absolutely. I mean, a little bit, um, I mean, I've mentioned this before. I often, and you and I have been on a couple of difficult jobs. Yep. And one of the things that I often go to uh, before a meeting, and I definitely did it before that particular one, mm -hmm. which is um, there's a verse that I often think of. It's called a soft answer turneth away wrath. Mm -hmm. And probably more along the lines of your dad's thought than yep. your grandpa there. But just yep. like, you know, sometimes going in and saying you're sorry mm -hmm. or in, and just listening. I mean, mm -hmm. it really applies to almost anything. Like yep. to be heard. I mean, we talk about that a lot lately, mm -hmm. I think, in just cultural settings that, you know, are this person person's being heard and are they being listened to? Do they feel appreciated? Well, and you know, those tough ones, like they, a lot of times your customer just wants to talk and like, they want to tell you what they don't like or what they're upset with. And they kind of just want to get it out. And then it's like, without saying like, okay, are you done? You're like, you know, I understand, like I'm hearing you. Right. So then it's like, mm -hmm. what can we do to fix it? Right. Yep. What can we do to make it right? I, I would say for me, the three things that initially attracted me to concrete science mm -hmm. was uh, actually I, my first contact was actually with your dad yep. and he had excellent communication. And then he set me up with you yep. <laughs> and yep. you have, you have, you have uh, improved upon that. The 2.0 communication, you're a phenomenal <laughs> communicator. Yep. And as someone who loves communication, obviously you respond well to other people, mm -hmm. but really I'd set, call it your bedside manner if you were a physician, because you are very blessed with, um, confrontational clients yep. and you know you helped us in a very difficult situation and um there there's really unfortunately that particular one there was no really right way out of that one yeah. it's like no matter what you do you lose no matter what and so like the way you handled it was incredibly um supportive not only of us as a company but also just impressive to watch because sometimes it's not very easy and in some ways i guess you were able to come in because you kind of came in with the superman cape i forgot now that i think about it, you weren't originally on the project we brought you in to solve the problem i remember this one and yep. so you got to sort of be superman and you know i <laughs> it's scary though putting on the cape right yeah you were the cape and you were like mark i'm trying to i'm trying to do the best i can and anyway i yeah you were you did a phenomenal job anyone out listening if you need superman uh, uh, chase six is your guy <laughs> i don't know those are but like yeah it's funny because like internally like you know like i'm freaking out but like you can't show that either because yeah, oh, sure. you're like you basically got to hit a home run otherwise you kind of look dumb well and you yeah. can also see all the tension right like you're oh, walking yeah. in and you're just like whoa mm -hmm. i don't know all the backstory here yep. you know you have a relationship with me obviously yep. and you're trying to listen to the client because they had they had legitimate concerns and you yep. helped fix it so those are all legit but you know you uh you definitely walked a tightrope there and you, you did a great job and, you know at the end of the day and this is like for you too it's like at the end of the day it's like we have to maintain our relationship with each other so it's like that's the hard part on those ones because it's like the customer and this is at people that work in residential it's like they'll try to put you against the builder 100%. or they'll probably put you against the painter or the last guy this is one thing that I've taken real well from working with my family. It's like you never say anything bad about anyone else's work or any other contractors, no no matter what situation you're in or the person you're working for. Because it's like, guess what? They always find out and they always hear it, you know? Yeah. And you can – that's great advice. Actually, you demonstrated that beautifully at that job. I think sometimes it, there was, you know, an issue where you could say, well, I would have done it differently, but this was a good job, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you're acknowledging what the issue is, but you're also saying like – um, you know, I may have done it differently, but that doesn't mean that how they did it yeah. was the wrong way to do it. And, and yeah. Cause everyone's trained differently. And you know, and the guy that did the last job, he's just like a good guy. So it's yeah. like, we, we remember we talked with him on the phone. He's like, there's, there's nothing wrong with this person. Maybe he had a bad couple of jobs or whatever, right. you know? Yeah. So yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I actually bring up something that is a reoccurring topic and you're the first person I've talked to this about on the podcast, but, uh, and it's you, you know, you and I are trade partners together, mm -hmm. right? And so we have a mutual client and you and I, you know, hopefully, you know, I'm going to probably do this for a couple of decades, just, you know, yep. assuming health and interest and everything <laughs> lines up. And, uh, and you know, you're a young age as well. So if as long as you're staying in it, you know, we'll likely work together for multiple years, multiple decades potentially. And, you know, sometimes I've had clients to your point, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's this balance because I understand where the client is coming from. They'll come to me and they'll say, Mark, mm -hmm. you know, I want you to go at Chase and I want you to get a lower price. Yep. And it's usually price. It almost always ends up being about money. Yep. Um, 
Uh, Because if it's quality, if there was a bad job, like then I would be aligned with it, with the client, right? I would say, okay, this isn't satisfactory. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the right thing to do. And that's also why we work with valuable people like yourselves, Mm -hmm. because you would say, I agree, because you're you're also very self-critical. You'd say, yep, that's not up to our standard. How can we help? Yep. That that's a who can argue with that response? Mm -hmm. I mean, that we all make mistakes. The the problem is, is when a client comes to us and say, hey, we've asked you to get us the lowest price. I mean, usually I'll say, first of all, you're not coming to me because I'm the lowest price number one. That's what I was gonna say. I mean, that's the. I mean. (laughs) You're, that's just not, I mean, oh. we are very good value yep. and we do a phenomenal job for what we do. So yep. in, in that context, yes. But if you're going to the lowest price, I mean, we're not the Walmart builders yep. and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with Walmart. Walmart crushes me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are national builders that can out, you know, I'll produce me a thousand to one. Mm-hmm. That's just not what I'm good at. No, and so and kudos to them. They're amazing at that. They also can't do what I do. Yep. And so everyone kind of stays in the lane that way. But going back to the client kind of asking us to do, I, you know, I'm very clear, like, I even tell the client, like, you know, they are my family in mm-hmm. the extension that, you know, like any family, yep. you, there are some family members that depending on who they marry and how that all works, like you're navigating that relationship, but Absolutely. they're still your family. Mm-hmm. Our trade partners, we've been with some of our guys for, you know, 30 years, 40, 50 years between my dad's company and my grandpa's company. Yep. And now a lot of them are starting to retire, obviously. And so we're kind of- The you good know, ones are getting old. They are. And I yeah. mean, our plumbers, luckily their kids are in it now. And so it's like, I know. Um, you know, we're good to go there. And so, you know, you're a third generation. So, you know, we're, we've, you know, you got a nice fit there, but I, I guess walk me through from your point of view yep. um, for those listening that get this question asked by a homeowner you know it's it's not a right thing to ask but what would be your response I mean do you deal with this in a different way because like while well, you and I have a trade trade relationship do you have other trade relationships where you would have maybe like a supplier like I don't know Semstone or I, I don't know enough yeah. about your business to know like who you partner with or, where they're saying hey you know I need you to go after this person to get me a lower price like how do you respond to those kinds of no absolutely and and so I'm lucky because in my position I'm basically production so I oversee installations but then I do a lot of like higher level more difficult sales like like working with you with like high end clients. And so I see both sides. Um, I have a really good relationship with our distributors, manufacturers, our, our supplier of epoxy, like resinous products. I call my, like my friend will go to hockey games. We have lunch. And so it's like having those relationships, but in regards like to the price, I've never liked to go to my suppliers on like a, I guess unless it's a really big job, I don't like to beat them up on price because I want to feel that our relationship is good enough where I am getting the best price. And I feel like it maybe could come off as offensively Mm -hmm. if I'm like, hey, can I get this lower? And they're like, you know, Chase, we're giving you a really good deal here. So with that customer, a lot of times what I can do or what I've done in the past is like I bid it differently where our salesmen, they use a price book. So it's a book of basically prices that they're instructed to charge now. We have our margin built into there, but if I'm bidding a job, I like to look at it like, how long is this going to take me? How many guys? I'll calculate my materials, you know, how many gallons or, you know, what's my coverage rate, you know, et cetera. And then I put my margin on it. You know, I look at the client and I look at them as if it's like a headache factor, like, right. you know, like I'm going to keep my price because I know I'm probably going to go back there a couple of times for meetings or, you know, hey, this is new construction. Uh, you know, client seems easy. Like we had really good meetings and stuff like this. I want this job. You know, then it's like, then I'll just lower my margin. Where if like I was making X, you know, I'll make Y. You know, they people call it sharpening your pencil. But you know, a lot of factors are. I think it kind of relates back to who we're dealing with, right? That's a that's a great answer because you're right. Because ultimately, if one of my best clients called me today, I'm thinking of who this person is, and yep. it's like, I need this or this happened. It wouldn't even be a question. Like mm-hmm. I'll either take care of it mm-hmm. or like I just want them to be happy because they're they were the best. And they're also the ones that don't either, don't ask for it. So if they ever did, mm-hmm. absolutely. And then the ones that ask for it all the time, mm-hmm. it's a constant battle. To your point, you you're smarter than I am because you saw it right away. Like, you know, this is a PIA fee, right? I'm like, and we don't have a line like that in there. Maybe somebody does out there, but you know, but you understand that like this is a hard business. And I'm sure you know, I relate a little bit to real estate sales, right? Like sometimes a real estate agent, you know, gets beat up because they have an easy sale, mm-hmm. but they have some that they've searched for homes for a couple of years and don't get yep. paid at all. Yep. And that is all getting kind of ironed out in the wash. And I feel like, you know, we don't have that many super difficult clients. I think you end up talking about it because it's kind of like therapy, frankly. No, it is. <laughs> and, and it's it's a bonding. Like how to, and it's also a way of problem solving. Like yeah. I'll often ask other builders, hey, I'm having this situation. You know, how how do you deal with it? Where if I'm going to go around saying I have the best client ever and like, well, there's oh, how do you feed? Good for you. I'm really glad you have a great client. And I sincerely mean that. Mm-hmm. But it's like, where's the learning in that? Yeah. Like, and I, I feel like when you talk about the issues you have, as long as it's in a, and you can healthily vent sometimes too, but 
I do feel like if you call someone like, hey, I'm dealing with this situation, even in other business owners, you and I, I think that's what's that I love about this podcast, frankly, mm -hmm. is that like you get to understand what, what are the pinch points of other people's businesses and then you can apply that to your own business we have i have a kind of not a, it's a funny story it's a little bit broad but like uh customers professions so and it's funny because it's a coincidence on like four jobs like two driveways two pool decks um we've struggled with dent dentists like as a subgroup like, like the dentists are difficult they're the customer and it's like not even a coincidence anymore right That's so like interesting. we've done two perfect pool decks and two perfect driveways and you'll get like a, a hairline crack off a, of a ladder <laughs> cup or in the corner of the driveway. And he's like demanding it needs to be torn out. And so like full circle, you know, kind of the reason for the story is like I try to remember, you know, A, why people are difficult. But you really tried and you, I think you, you're obviously probably good at this, but you like, you're probably successful because you can read people a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. And like okay. sometimes you'll just miss. Right. Yep, but like. Yep. You can feel when it's going to be tough, you know? The problem is, as an optimist, yeah. and I always say this, what makes me really good at remodeling yep. also makes me bad at spec home building, mm -hmm. if you will, because mm -hmm. like I can go into a really bad home mm -hmm. and be like, I can make this amazing. Yep. But just because I can make it amazing doesn't mean I should make it amazing. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Yeah, <laughs> or easy, right. And so I feel like sometimes with a person we ignore or like everyone would say, hey, if it's a red flag, like, you know, if somebody hit somebody or we had someone on the podcast that the client actually yelled at um, their spouse in front of them. Oh, wow. and, and the builder's like, I'm out. I'm yep. done. If 100%. you talk if you talk that way to your wife, I'm done. And my point is, if someone got a big red flag like that, you'd be like, OK. But it's like how many little orange flags? Because, you know, not everyone's perfect. Nobody's your dream client or not everyone's your dream client but so it's like you do have to still run a business and you oh, know absolutely. not every per client is going to be your best friend and that's okay because there's only so much time in your day because you're thinking about too like you have to get paid at the end yeah. right and you don't want to end up in court and like you don't want to give a massive discount at the end so it's like you're trying to like vet them to yes. some degree but like also like you have a reputation and a brand so it's like you can't just turn someone down on a whim you know no of course not. I'd, I'd say that's probably the hardest part of our job is uh just you, you know the customers but also you know the good and bad it's like so i have a note here so last year we did 1400 jobs 1400 yeah wow. and so like we joke all the time so it's like we don't run a background check we don't run a credit check you know, basically you call in, you give your down payment, you know, some, you know, most home, but like, you know, down payment. But if we're working direct with clients, everyone's half down, but it's like, you're not doing any homework at all on these people. So it's like 1400, you know, husbands and wives. And it's like, you're going to get a few kind of odd ones. Yeah. And, oh. and we remember them all. And like, I actually have, I have this green notebook on my desk and it's like, it's, a, it's like a construction note manual. And so it's like just pages and pages. And I'll write notes about when I have a really bad customer. And I'm like, I kind of note bullet points on the experience. What did we end up doing? Did we give them a full discount, a full refund? And like every winter when we have downtime, I'll kind of go through the notebook and I'll be like, oh my God, I remember that job. And like <laughs> in my head, I'm like, I know like if I had the opportunity to do this again, I could do a few of these things better. And I think when you're in this residential market, like working with, I say husbands and wives, husbands, 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 and husbands, wives or wives, you kind of have to, you kind of have to be built for dealing with residential customers mm -hmm. versus on a commercial job site. Like my uncle, it's like, he's got one GC and then he's got a bunch of subs working next to him. And then he's got, you know, the, the person that puts the funding in for the project, but mm -hmm. you know, you don't have, you know, the wife coming in looking at it and being like, ooh, like it's that color gray. And the husband's like, yeah, what do you mean? Like, that's what we pick, you know? <laughs> I, yes, I've seen that happen. <laughs> oh my gosh. And it like, it, yeah, it just you have to be built differently for the residential work. And it, it makes it fun, but it's like, it's not for everyone for sure, because it's like, you have to kind of bend and you have to cater to these people and they're paying you and you have to be you know, really, really nice and respectful, even if they're saying, you know, some weird things sometimes. But yeah, it's like, I, I think that's probably what makes you good at your job. You I think know? it takes a large emotional bandwidth, mm -hmm. right? Because it's very emotional. We talk about that a lot about how, I mean, we, you know, yeah, a wedding is very emotional, right? Yep, yep. Um, building a home. Oh uh, my is, God. I actually, one of the things I want to do, I want to have a wedding planner on and a project manager yep. and do a three-way uh, conversation mm -hmm. where I would ask a question and then and then who, the audience would have to guess who I'm talking to. Because I have a feeling that a wedding planner and a project manager would have very similar oh, stories if you've left out some of the details. Absolutely. Yeah. I, well, I would imagine, I know like the wedding is such a big deal these days. People are spending crazy amounts, but like the home is the same way because it's like, you're most of the time building people's dream homes. Yeah. I mean, that mm -hmm. that's kind of your niche. And so 
what's involved in that. And like, frankly, even I think there's a connotation with price point, but I will say this just to pause you there for a second is yep. that regardless of where you're at when you're building your home, most people think that's their dream home. Now, I think sometimes in their people mind like, well, that's not my dream, dream home, right? Mm-hmm. And air quote it. But I, I, any home is emotional to your point. But yes, as the dollars creep up or mm-hmm. at least the, as the dollars creep up in proportion to what the person can afford, yep. that dream home status inflates expectations as well. Yeah. No, absolutely. Like I like John and Leah, like that's their dream home, right? Mm-hmm. And you could tell they're super passionate about it. And it's like, they live next door and their home was beautiful, but you could tell this was like for them, it was like, it was like a piece of art, right? And like everything was custom, like to the nine. So it's like, and I, I sort of envision myself in these people's positions sometimes because it's like at breakfast, they're talking about it before bed. They're talking about it. at dinner. They're talking about it, you know? So it's like, it's just consuming their lives. So it's like, you're kind of pressed in this position of, you know, having to kind of be perfect, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. And the thing that was unique about that situation is they were so proud of their house. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, with him living next door, mm-hmm. I mean, he honestly was at the house probably four or five times oh, we, a day. We know. Yeah, you know. Yeah, he probably helped you. <laughs> and uh, which was, I mean, that's that's pros and cons, right? I mean, yeah. I'm sure John will listen to this. The house would go faster. <laughs> if okay. the, but that's okay because yeah. he his, his blood and his passion would be in it. And yeah. I actually love that about him because it made it so rewarding because, you know, you'd be gone. I'd come into, let's say I was out of town or whatever. I'd come into the house. He would show me things about the house that, you know, I usually would already know about. Sometimes he would have changed something earlier in the day that I didn't know about, yep. but he was so excited to share it. And that kind of enthusiasm yep. as a tradesperson, as someone who's wanting to like build this for you, like, how can you not get energized oh, by that? Like remember, I, to me, I was like, yes, this is amazing. He loved like tradesmen too, right? Oh, loved them. He I loved know. everyone that worked on his house. I think that's so cool for people to really appreciate those people. Cause it's like, A, they're building this like for you. And then it's like, you know, in, in your business too, it's like the homeowner almost is like, it's like they're, they're a part of it in the sense that like they are designing this with you and they're seeing it through to the end. So it's like they have these visions and these dreams and the color scheme and design coming together. And it's like, and it's, it's your world, these high, these high end homes. Cause in, in my mind, I think, you know, Mark D. Williams homes, I think, you know, high end homes. Well, thank right? you. It looks like our marketing's working. Yeah, no, but so <laughs> I think, you know, for that customer, it's like, they are like one-to-one in that mm-hmm. process with you. And I, I think that's, you know, back full circle to our customer conversation. I think that's what makes your job, my job, it makes it fun, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah, I think like any relationship and, you know, any marriage, I mean, often, I mean, it's, it's been commonly said, right. That a, that it's like a marriage or like a long-term relationship building a home. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, um, you know, you, you get a, a more, a deeper relationship for sure. I mean, you know, their kids' names, they know your kids. I yep. mean, I often will start a lot of conversations just because, you know, I've got, you know, little kids. So I'm constantly showing pictures to my clients. Oh, and so like, good and, icebreaker too. and they, yeah, well, and they, but they, they want to enter into because mm-hmm. a lot of them, you know, they either have kids mm-hmm. or they remember what that was like, or they have grandkids. And mm-hmm. so, you know, they're just, they also see it through the lens of, you know, they're more mature in life. And so they're like, here's a younger person that has a business. We're really excited. I mean, so it becomes, it, the emotion goes both ways. Like yep. you can feel the care that they have for you as well. Yep. And I think it's something that's reciprocated that makes building very special and very rewarding. Oh yeah, it's it's the human aspect of it too. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm sure there's many times where you're going to look at a project on a Saturday and this was me growing up and it's like, I'm in the car with my dad. We're going to look at jobs. We're walking around. I have no idea what I'm looking at at that age, but it's like, he's meeting with the client. It's like, oh, who's that? It's like, oh, this is my son. You know, he's six years old or whatever. And it's like, that's how I grew up. And that's something that I want to kind of pay it forward, you know, as my kids get older, but I'm sure you're kind of in the same boat. It's like the the work never stops. So it's like having family kind of involved in it is fun, but it, it allows the people that you work with see that you're just a normal person, just like mm-hmm. them, right? You have soccer at 930, but you, you have to go look at this job at eight. Right. Yeah. So yeah. no, it, it's, it's a constant balance as a, as an owner. Uh, and really for anybody, especially when you're trying to make sure you're, you know, pleasing the clients. I found for myself that uh, my wife has helped with this a lot, but you know, time blocking, we talked a little bit about yep. that, you know, setting some parameters on your day. Uh, I also think the generation that we're in, um, we're, while we're more, everyone is a little bit more flexible I, th- I feel like people are more understanding i could oh, be absolutely. wrong in that because i feel like your grandpa's generation yep. like they work 24 7 man yep. mm-hmm. um like if someone wants me to meet on a saturday like that's not going to happen i make that very clear with them yep. like if it was an isolated thing someone flew into out, 
of town and they need to be sure I'd make arrangements. But yep. as a general rule, mm-hmm. I mean, we're going to be working with you for two and a half years. It can wait till Monday. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, the whole texting thing, I, I feel like our generation texts too much. Mm-hmm. I'm fine with like, hey, text me if you're running late <laughs> like I was or, yep. you know, something happens. But ultimately, it's a phone call. It's an email. You know, give us a way to respond to this in a business. Boundaries. Bo- some boundaries. And I think, I think part of it is, is when it's a house, again, it's emotional again. Mm-hmm. And so people let their emotion go away. Like, would you be emailing your doctor at not 10 o'clock at night? No, nope. never. No. Nope. Would you be, would you be texting your doctor at, you know, one o'clock in the morning? Yeah. No. I mean, you get these email stamps from some of your clients mm-hmm. and they're these crazy hours yep. and that's fine. It's fine if it's an email, right? I can respond to it in a business day. So I'm okay with that. Yep. But like the texting thing, we really try to, and it's for their health too. Like mm-hmm. I don't want clients to think it's self-serving, although it, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with putting some protections. Like I can come to the job site Monday, much more of mentally prepared. Mm-hmm. You can get the best version of me, right? Yep. Whether it's your health and exercise, your family time, people need that in order to be the best artist of whatever, or whatever you're going to do. That's what you need. And I feel like that comes with like, obviously your experience, but that's something I've learned in the last couple of years. Yeah. I didn't know that right away. Oh my God. <laughs> I remember my first three years and I was with my wife. I, we were just dating at the time, but like I would answer phone calls at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 8.30 PM. And it's like, she was like, is this going to be like this forever? And I was like, I don't know. Like, right. you know, but then as you get older and you create structure and you create boundaries and I think just professionalism, you know, is, is more like you're able to control it more. Right. Mm-hmm. You know? And, and so now it's like my phone will ring after five 30 and it's just like, you know, we can handle this tomorrow. I'll lift in the voice, listen to the voicemail, unless it's like a pressing emergency, right. you know, but, um, I feel like, that that definitely comes with experience because I remember in the beginning it was like I was just trying to be a pleaser. Like uh, I think know. anyone that is early on in their career yep. and hopefully I mean you're right. I wish you could know now <laughs> things <laughs> you knew. knew then what you know now because yep. man the maturity and I think too you know talking a little bit about even like pricing and value. I think something that you know growing up in the industry, I don't think people can totally appreciate like all the wisdom and the knowledge that you specifically can tap into with three generations at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it just takes time and knowledge. Like I think of what I know now, even the last couple of years, while there's been some difficult situations we've had to overcome, like my knowledge set, Mm -hmm. like you pay for that. I remember during the first recession and, you know, nine, 10 and 11, I remember someone told me that I got my master's degree in business and half the time and quadrupled the expense. Oh my God, I know. (laughs) And I was like, you don't have your MBA, but you survived the recession. So that's like worth a couple. No, it's so true. Like I look at problematic jobs and not referencing anything specifically but jobs that like didn't go well but like you got through them and it's like whether you lost money or whatever but it's like you got to take something away from that man otherwise you're you're not doing your job right mm-hmm. yeah how, how have i just keep you know i've got a ten thousand questions but we only have uh not that much time left i guess looking at the clock how from a business structure you're at yep. 130 people now yep how did it kind of organically grow did you see kind of big surges or do you kind of do you continually add like a couple of people a year walk me a little bit through i'm always fascinated because mm-hmm. we're kind of at a growth stage in our on our own building company. It's like, yep. you know, do I hire a few more? Like, what does that look like? So I'm most interested in people's systems. Like walk me through the evolution of how you've hired, you know, how, how do you hire? Do you do personality assessments? Do you, how do you fire? Like walk me through a little bit about how you've grown this business to this large, this, the size, as well as like, you know, how do you maintain company culture? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, long story short. So how's housing market crash? We were a union company. Um, we went non-union, got sued by the unions, had to pay that off, but we basically went from, Hundred people to ten, and um, whoa! And they made you pay. Oh my gosh! It was like what? It, it was a crazy amount of money. I don't know anything about. I, I should know more about union, and not maybe this uh, isn't the place to talk about that. No, but it, really, I, that's shocking to me. So you yep. went from a hundred to ten, and like, and we're penalizing you as well. Yep, because basically we knew that we couldn't afford to pay the union wages for you know what we were getting after the housing market collapsed and the type of work we were doing. And so it kind of got rid of everyone, found guys that we had to let go, jobs. Ten of them stayed with us. One of our main demo guys, Jeff, he's still with us, our mechanic, Bill, and they've been there for like 30 years. But then moving forward, you know, moving in this residential market, slowly hiring. But how we were able to grow really fast in the last five years was, you know, my dad was basically like, you can't hire any good people in the concrete industry because if they're good either there's a reason why they're not working or they're doing well on their own. Right. And so we were able to buy up three or four small companies. Um, we were able to buy up a, a wall company. We were able to buy up a pool company. A, when I say pool, a pool deck installations, kind of what they specialized in. 
And we went from 20, 30 to, to 100 by basically acquiring smaller companies. I see. Yep. And, and were those people actively looking to sell or did your dad go have relationships with, with them and say, hey, this is a segment of business that I would like to have under concrete science? Uh, how, how does how do those yeah. conversations happen? Yeah. And I was lucky to be a part of a lot of the conversations early in my career, but they kind of went like this. Like the, the owner of that company was so tired of – Going, working, going home, having to enter time, doing payroll, paying bills, you know, then, you know, customers not paying, then you don't have the money to pay the bills. So it's kind of this grind of being a small company and being owner operator, right? So they're like, I would much rather be employed by someone else, you know, have my salary, make sure my guys have a place to work, make sure they're getting hours, you know, working in the winter. And because their guys are their family, especially in a small company. So it's like, Okay, Steve, you know, my dad, you can do that for us. So it's like you buy out the equipment, um, you give them some money for their company, you bring them on as, is a, like a higher level role, whether uh, they're, uh, you know, managing that group still or they're, you know, being elevated kind of not to a, you know, like executive, but like they're running that group, you know, not having to dig holes and pour concrete every day. And that's what a lot of them want, just get off their hands and knees. But that allowed us in those four or five acquisitions to grow a lot because, any people that are in concrete that are listening to this know it's like you can't hire good guys. So it's like, how do you do it? So we were Can able you to train them in. I mean, what's the, what's yep. the I mean, so, is that so, essentially how do, how do you get new people then? <laughs> well, yeah. So, so now getting this kind of large group of people, it allows us to have laborers and stuff learn underneath a larger group where if there's just 20 of us and you're trying to train in guys, it's hard because it's like every guy kind of has to be good, you know? Yep, I so, you. you know, being a larger number, we're allowed to train more, um, you know, kind of have guys take longer to train in. Um, but my group specifically uh, on the coding side, um, you know, really blessed and getting really, you know, four or five really good guys. And then, you know, having them want to to train younger people because they are younger themselves. Um, coding's concrete are different. You don't need to be, you know, 35 or 40 and be like a really good finisher to get into coding's. You can kind of learn it quick. And so you know, different type of industries, but um yeah, I think it's impossible to grow in our industry without having some sort of mergers or acquisitions just because the talent is hard to attract. And then also um, there's not a lot of young kids signing up to do this type of work. Have you done – I've done a little bit of outreach with uh, Minnetonka High School to bring mm-hmm. on their kids to do – it's called the Vantage Plus program where they come in to do a project over a semester. But mm-hmm. they're looking at it from a business standpoint, which is obviously still very valuable. Yep. And I believe they have a segment um, – I don't know if it's in the state or just in that district where they have more uh, carpentry outreach and stuff like that. Have you reached out to any high schools or any, are there any programs like that where you can essentially have, I mean, I know in corporate world they have interns and, yep. you know, work for train. Like how, how does that work to educate the younger people? Cause you know, people might be very interested in this, in the business, especially for me, I would be interested in the micro tops and like oh, all these dual finishes. I think that's super interesting. The decorative stuff is yeah. cool. And I think we have a shot at kind of my focus was more of the coatings, but we, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm narrowing to a specific area, but we found that, you know, some of the schools out west are more open to doing more trade oriented discussions with some of their kids than maybe some of the more suburban schools or things like that. And so there's a few that I've kind of, you know, picked that I'd like to go into and like maybe talk to uh, that part of like the school, whether it's a, a group of kids that are interested in trade school, maybe just give my experience, but then just say like, hey, and this is. I went to college, like I have student loans. Like I, I was actually a journalism major, which doesn't apply to anything now. But remember my dad told me you can't work for the family company if you don't go to school. And I was like, all right, that's fair. You know, but a lot of kids now these days, it's like they, they don't have to go to a four year university. Uh, a lot of you know plumbers, electricians, I'm sure many people you talk to, there's very valuable positions in trade and they can make $55 an hour. And, really good wages. Yeah. And it's not like one of my best friends is an electrician. He does extremely well and it's not backbreaking work. Um, he enjoys it, you know, and it's just like, I think that that model of, you know, forcing kids to go to four and you know six year universities is, is kind of not the norm as much as it used to be, which I think is great. I mean, I think it, I think just understanding, I think there's a lot more conversations, especially as education has gotten so expensive. Yes. Um, and I think also as it's, I mean, unless we have a large surge of immigration, I mm-hmm. mean, this, the U S population based on numbers is not going to be able to support the no. needs that we have oh. and especially in construction, but frankly, every, so now we're all, I mean, you talked about buying companies. I mean, essentially you're going to have to buy employees one way or yep. another. And that, now you're, now you're paying 
for unskilled labor, that's it, it just it becomes a very spiraling. I mean, we're certainly not the only industry that has to deal with this, but because I feel like we have a low barrier of entry, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, if you're going to be a scientist, yep. you know, I don't think you can just go be a scientist. Nope. You need some, uh, you need education. That's fine. And I'm not saying you don't need education. Same I, with I doctors, certainly, things yeah, like I that. I certainly legal. believe in education, but I, I just wish it was more celebrated craftsmanship. I was listening to um, the modern craftsman and they were talking, Nick Schiffer was over in Europe Mm -hmm. and he was in uh, Switzerland and he was just talking about how in the school, the trade schools over there that they celebrate, there's really no white collar, blue collar, like everyone has the same collar in that really that uh, it's the craftsmanship, it's the love of what they do and they can all earn a good living. And whether you're a biochemist, I guess you're in Switzerland, you're building Rolexes uh, or you are a carpenter, you can make similar incomes. And now that's, I understand that that's not going to be the U.S. model. I'm not naive enough to think that that's going to happen. But that doesn't mean that some of that can't trickle down. And like when I was a kid, we had shop class. Mm-hmm. Like we did all those things. Now I check in with some of these teachers, like they don't even have shop class in the school. They have college prep instead of shop. Yeah. I and know. so I, I feel like we're missing out on educating some of these un, un, just amazing trades and these in, incredible jobs that are out there for people that, and also that, guess what? They would love it. Oh, they would. It was, I, I have a cool story too. So we, we worked on a project at Denver. Mark uh, last winter. It was Did you really? three months. Yep. And so we worked on a water park and we were working next to the Masons and all the Masons were in their low twenties to mid twenties. And we kind of asked them, they're like, how did you guys learn this? And they went to like, they graduated from high school and they went to school for like two and a half or three years to be Masons. And there was like 20 of them. And my joke was like, okay, like, what do we have to do to get you to the U S like, do I tell them how much <laughs> Masons make or like, like, you know, like maybe you just got to come over and visit or whatever. But I just thought it was so cool that like, they basically segued into a trade right out of high school and they were proud of it. They're good at it. They made good money. Like it was just very That's exactly cool. exactly what I'm talking about. I think I just know. appreciation. I think also getting rid of the social stigma on certain things would be helpful there's too, a, right? There's a negative stigma with some construction. And obviously the stuff that we do and you do is like awesome, like the homes and stuff, but even like commercial construction and like tough stuff where, it, I mean, whether you're, you're doing like welding or like iron work, it's just like... I think sometimes, I don't know if it's social media or what, but it's like people joke about it and there's some like negative connotations with it. But it's like you meet those people and they're very normal, down to earth. They're doing well. They're taking care of their family. So it's like I think the sort of the vision needs to change about how we look at those people, to your point. 100%. If you, yeah. By the way, if you ever do something with schools and you want to co- oh. co-host, I would be happy to go talk. To, actually, that makes me want to go reach out to some schools and I don't know what Please. I would talk I would, about. But, you know. I'd be lo- I would love to get in front of kids you, and tell you, them to look into it. You'd bring your your finished trim carpenter. You could bring me, and then yep. you bring you know one of your you know your other maybe your painter or something. But I mean, you you could show kids just pictures of these homes too. And uh, I I I personally think carpentry is like the coolest thing ever because I don't do it and I'm not good at it. But like I interviewed a kid. It was probably two weeks ago, and his name was Val, and he's twenty four year twenty four years old. He was making thirty dollars an hour, finished trim carpenter, and he wanted to get into. Um, you know, our trade like concrete. And I'm like, dude, why don't you go work for like, you know, like a mark, you know? Cause I'm like, what you do is so cool. And he's like, but I think what you do is cool. And I'm just like, wow, you know, but I just, the, the cool part about it is the kid was 24 years old and he was a stud and like, he was a hockey player and he's like, I want to do stuff with my hands, yep. you know? And I was just like, there's just, not I think enough. that's special that he knows that at that age. I know. Cause I, I, you know, I think that this is something that I wish <laughs> someone had told me to do earlier, but like, I feel like in your twenties, like for, you know, I went to college as well mm-hmm. and I'm not sure what I learned. I feel like it was just a time to mature. <laughs> yep. I think it's like, and, it, it's a giant hurdle that they want you to jump over to see if you can do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's like, okay, you, you got over a hurdle. Mm-hmm. And I remember one teacher, a physics teacher actually said that we're teaching you how to learn. We don't expect you to remember, but can you remember how to learn? That was, I didn't do very well in physics, by me the neither. way. No, 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 like, <laughs> I always thought it was really cool though, by the way. Math and science, <laughs> man. It's like, we're, we're, what are we doing with algebra? now you know very very little but yeah yeah no i i agree on the college thing you know and it's like you went to college i went to college like i have no regrets about it but it's like i I love meeting kids that want to be in construction i just think it's so cool and it's like a hot like maybe it's your parents like how did you get that thought but it's just like there just needs to be more of that and like however we can do it i think it's just going to benefit everyone you know it would be kind of neat if they had like an apprenticeship program in high school or even like get out class early but yeah get i mean yeah get yeah into <laughs> and, and which, come come work for us for yeah, half a day but it would almost be kind of neat to do like in a one year you have to work with like 
six businesses or five yeah. businesses. And it doesn't even have to be construction. I yep. mean, you could pick, let's say, a construction route. Yep. You could pick like, you know, uh, heavy uh, uh, heavy construction or machine what, operations. Machine operations yep. You know, I mean, manufacturing. I yep. think that we're going to see a huge influx of manufacturing in the United States is mm -hmm. just my personal guess. I mean, yep. the one thing I think that COVID did was expose the number of manufacturing holes we have in the United States. Oh, it was horrible. It was terrible. I yep. mean, from every industry. And, and obviously, then there's some na national security stuff too, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, hey, if we're relying on XYZ, Com, you know, country to get us this, you know, they realize that, wow, after 30 days of not being able to get it, it had massive ripple effects through the economy. Oh, I'm sure you, what was it? It was like garage doors and what else? I mean, things came to a screeching halt, right? Well, I mean, obviously any microchips or any oh computer gosh. related stuff is yeah. not very, you know, is originated here. So we end up running into issues there. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, anyway, going back to it, I think it would, like, I would be fascinated. I would love to sign up for that class. Yep. That'd be an awesome class, like intro to business yep. and like five businesses would volunteer their time. Mm -hmm. And you shadow each one for like one week, yep. you know, for like two hours. See what you like. Yeah, see what you like. Yep. Hey, okay. that looks really cool. Man, I never want to do that. I know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know. Because it's like, you know, of all the trades, which one you wouldn't want to do. Because you kind of watch them. They're like, ooh, that, you know. I w actually, I want to have, uh, I'll have Randy Janelle from uh, Minnesota Custom Drywall on. I saw him <laughs> I saw him the other day. Well, I see even your reaction tells you the answer. And it was like, he, I, my joke is, is that even drywallers pay other drywallers to drywall their house. Oh, I know. Like, it is considered, like, it is a rough industry. I follow some, like, meme pages on Instagram. And it's always, like, the drywallers and, like, the tapers and the mutters, like, the butt end of the joke. And I feel bad because it's so important. But, like, I also get the jokes right know, oh just, for sure they come out and they're just like well you know white. But we'll have randy on because i would love to hear how he got into drywall and uh -huh. how he's stayed in drywall because yeah. it's sort of a thankless job and then t you have to talk about those employees too because they're always very interesting people you know oh very yep you know, for sure so um let's from your let's finish up here a little bit more yep. about the company i know i had about 20 more questions i wanted to ask you but we're gonna no, run out good. of time how the structure of your company now. Yep. I mean, you're a big enough company now. Like HR culture. How, walk me through. How do you how do you maintain a, a company of that size? I mean, I'm a company of five. Yep. And I, I always get blown away. You know, like I said, Mark Shear was on the other day, and you know, he had 300 employees. Yep. And it's just kind of mind boggling when you're a small company. You look at a big company, you're like, wow, how does how do you I mean, how do you navigate that many people? No, I thought, what what systems do you have in play to do that? I thought a lot about this question, and then so it's like you hate to call it like separations, but it's like there's the office and the field, and there's always kind of a little bit of combativeness between that. But it's like basically, it's like all your divisions are kind of groups, but like you you all co mingle. Um, I think a lot of it is just from the start. It's just like hiring good people. Like when we interviewed Josh, who's our CFO, we interviewed um, another gentleman. And he worked on all the funding for the U.S. Bank and like he had a glowing resume and, and Josh came from a really good company, but we just viewed him as a better fit because like I don't need to mean to be stereotypical, but it's like he liked to hunt. He liked to fish. You know, he just seemed like a regular guy. He's from Otsego or offices in Corcoran. And so it's like my dad always taught me. It's like sometimes it's about hiring the better fit than the better applicant, you know? That's a really wise advice. Yeah, and so it's like, and we have a good culture in the office as far as, I, do I get along with everyone every day? Like, no. Do I butt heads with certain people? Like, absolutely. But, you know, it's like you all have to coexist. You all have to work together. Um, but find people that are, you know, similar in some way, you know. Um, I think people that are sort of extroverted, you know, is obviously good. Like you can have an office full of extroverts in construction. And if you hire an introvert, like they probably aren't going to last long because it's just not their, right. you know, it's not their they have idea. To be some, they have to be somebody they're not. Y correct. And that's, it's, it's fatiguing just like for yeah. an extrovert to be an introvert is difficult too. And and in the field, um, you know, I, I think in the field and, and we'll just, we can use my group as, as a, um, as an example. So in our field, like our, our epoxy garage floor guys, um, mostly Latino, uh, Latino Hispanic workers. And I speak Spanish. I get along with all of them. Great. Like I consider them my family. And then on our resurfacing side, your microtop, your polishing, um, guys that travel out of town and I'll travel with for, you know, two to three weeks to a month on end. They're all, you know, Caucasian guys. And my favorite part about big jobs is I get to get them all together. And then I just crack jokes the whole time because you really got to break <laughs> the ice, but it's sure. like seeing them co-mingle. It's just like, you know, you can have a group of 20 guys from very different backgrounds, but when we're all passionate about the same work, we all have families, we all have kids. And so it's like, I love that part of construction where you can get all these people together and just kind of, you know, make them get along, you know, mm -hmm. like we never have any you know jobs where there's fights, issues and negativity. We don't have any problem employees if we do. Um, and this is this is a lot of people that I've learned from, too. If you have any cancer in the company, you got to cut it out because it, it can spread and it's difficult. So. You know, people that we find that aren't good fits, they don't last long just because it, 
you know, and even uh, uh, Luis, my main foreman on my garage side, we'll hire a guy and he'll come to me and he'll say like, I don't think this guy is going to be a good fit. And you know, as well as I know, it's like, you have to lean on your guys for things like that, right. you know? And yeah. you're like, you know, Hey, and, and if Luis sees me get rid of that guy in two weeks, he knows that I trust him to help me. Right. It have... validates the relationship and the fact that you, you yep. know, a lot of people say you have an open door policy, yep. but your actions say it's closed. Yep. And, yeah. And, that's, and that's good. You got to lean on your people, man. It'd be like, if you hire a, a temp tomorrow and then, you know, He's working with Mike, and, and uh, Mike comes in. He's like, uh, you know, you're like, all right, we'll give him a couple of weeks, right? You know, but it's Mike like, is about the calmest guy on the planet. You'd have to give that guy, <laughs> you know, you'd have to put a pulse heart on him and be like, hey, yeah. if your pulse moves one beat, we'll know yeah. something's up. He's very calm. But yeah, I mean, it's like, and, and, when, and when you have good people in the office, good people can read people, mm-hmm. and you, you can kind of see through some of the BS. And if you know if someone's disingenuine or if you feel like they're not really who they are, you know, I think that's that's part of you know being an owner of a company is like okay. you, i don't like yeah. for you I, I think if you if you knew if you didn't know how to hire good people you probably don't last very long right i think what your dad said was interesting that you hire the right fit, not the best candidate for yep. the job. I think that's really interesting. I feel like right now I'm in a position where I would like to do more interviewing uh, without the need to hire mm-hmm. so that when it comes to hire, then I could actually get who I wanted. It's good practice. Because I feel like, well, I haven't done that. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. not. A, I've been doing the wrong practice for a long time yep. because you know, typically I'm like, I need to hire someone. And they always say like, when you know you need to hire someone, it, you've already passed the time of needing them. Yep. And so I, I, that's, you know, as a small company, I'm very sensitive to overhead. And so I'm like, man, I... I don't know. And I don't really have any aspirations to be, you know, a, a large company, but maybe, I don't know, that'd be an interesting thing. Like, did your dad want to be a 130 person company or is that, did it kind of just happen organically? I know he had a revenue number in his mind where he's like, basically this number of guys has to give us, get us to this yep. revenue point. And then, you know, you lean on your, your subordinates. That's like, how many guys do they need in their crews? You kind of have to fill yep. those slots. That makes like, sense. like, you know, right now we're, we're doing a lot of hiring, but you know, one thing that I've learned too, is like right now I know I have enough guys I don't need to hire, but when you get complacent like that, it's like all of a sudden March, you got three guys quit and you're like, man, I should have been going through resumes. I should have been looking at. So do you guys kind of keep an open door policy to continually interview people? Yep. Yeah. Um, indeed. It works great. Um, we, we try to use that billboard we have in, um, I think it's like Albertville for hiring, but um, we were always hiring because I feel like if you become complacent in, in not hiring, it can really hurt you when guys leave. It, it, and you know, I mean, your subs in our industry, I mean, Sometimes you lose one guy, he'll take three guys with him. I mean, so you know, it just yeah. it's construction. It's tough. So it's like I have to remind myself. And I thought of this today because I saw Woody in our concrete production office. He had four interviews yesterday, and I haven't done an interview in like a year. And I'm like, I gotta get back on this because <laughs> guys leave in March. They'll stay through the winter because it's like you know it's it's tough. But March comes, there's more opportunities. They'll leave. They'll go work for a different company. They'll go do their own thing. And then you're down a crew. And sometimes a crew is, you know, it's a quarter million dollars of revenue a year. So it's like you got to be diligent or uh, diligent at least about meeting people, seeing resumes, having guys in your back pocket, things like that. Do you touch base with them? Like, you know, knowing that, hey, if March or as things get like right now, would you be doing extra touches or like extra mm-hmm. reach outs to the company with kind of that mindset? Like, hey, just, hey, I'm, I'm Chase. It's great to see you. I mean, I, I mean, how, what do you, is that? Uh, uh, no, my best guys. It took me three years to get Mario. Mario worked for a competitor's company and I'd text him. It was like April 1st every year. And I'd like, hey, Mario, like, can I take you out for lunch like you want to grab a beer like what do i got to do to get you over here no no third year he's finally like you know what yeah he's like i think this is the year and so it's like i save people in my phone specifically it's like new hire candidate i'll touch base them that carpenter kid i was telling you about earlier he's gonna help me do the trim at my house and i'm just totally gonna pump him up the whole time about coming to work for us (laughs) (laughs) i mean it's like you got to be savvy right that's funny i had a trim carpenter guy just called me uh actually yesterday i was gonna call you and be like who do you know (laughs) oh that's funny i got i just called the guy back today he called me you know i was in sales while i still am but Mm -hmm. you know right out of college i sold copiers for a year and you know i'd make 100 calls a day so Mm -hmm. even to this day if people call me i do my best to call them back because even if i have to tell them no you know it's i think a lot of people get ghosted and i hate that oh it's awful and even if i just say you know we're not hiring right now Mm -hmm. and you know you talk with them and sometimes it's even a trial trial like hey how easy are they going to give up you know like okay see you later like that but i like the guys that are like can i follow up with you in a quarter yeah okay i like that and and when they when they do follow up you're like okay this guy's serious like um we had a guy own us. He played minor league baseball. He's taking a year off or whatever. And he told me he wasn't going to work for us this year. And he texted me the other day. He's like, hey, is there any work, boss? I was like, no. He texts me every Friday. And I get, I promise you the day that I have worked for him, he'll be the first person I call. So it's like, 
you know if guys want the job right. you know, and you know if they'll, they'll be dedicated to you and, and they'll be good employees because, you know, it, say you interviewed a guy and, you know, hey, we're not hiring right now and you never hear from him again. Like, what do you think? He probably went to work somewhere else. He wasn't that interested. But if they're pushing on you, you're like, you know, maybe you give this guy a chance. There's right? this painting guy that's been after me for about three years. Okay. Very persistent. Yeah. He just texted me last night, and I, not last night, but yesterday afternoon, just all these beautiful photos. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I also think like you only have so many horses in the barn you can race. Like mm -hmm. the Kentucky Derby, what, it's like 20 horses? Yep. And it's like, you know, you might have 15 horses, but you're only racing two at that race. And it's like, are you going to give them a shot? Yeah. I don't know. No, because I'm, I'm really, the problem is I'm really loyal to my people. So it's yep. like, I have two mm -hmm. and right now, but you know, if we had a painting issue, yep. that would, and he happened to text me right when that happened. Yep. I'd probably be like, hey, why don't we have you? Why don't we have you take a look at this? And that's where it's like you kind of have to keep those relationships in our world because it's just like you just never know, right? Yeah. You know? Especially it's like, and then that situation does come about, and you hire him, and he does a good job, and you're like, yeah, hey, like everything happens for a reason. So as we wrap up here, let's, a few questions. One yep. is, uh, what does the next uh, couple of years look like? I mean, what are you guys seeing in terms of people always ask me the question all the time, like what's coming down the pipeline? You know, what's happening, and uh, you know, any technology changes that is happening? You know, within your industry. So we we're on like our fifth software in five years because my dad he just is like you know and there's always something better and new out so i think we're on the last software which i'm excited about <laughs> like scheduling financial like what it's all in one yeah it's scheduling it's um you, you guys know, don't sales. use builder trend do you we used builder trend two years ago okay. and then we were at service titan now and then the new one I asked our CFO if I could say the name, and he was like, "No, but I'll okay. tell Mark." <laughs> I, <laughs> That's fine. I could care less, but yeah. And so, it, and it's a lot of customization that went into it, and it was expensive. But yeah, new software, and the, and honestly, uh, I was telling Ian, but the last three years, uh, we've been renovating Great Wolf Lodge water park flooring. Oh. Really? So honestly, my kids like to go there. Like once a year, I'll you know my sister will come to town. Yep. We'll go there. And it, it like was uh, it was one job a year, and it was like you know five hundred thousand. And I think this year we'll do three or four of them, and then we do overnight renovations all over the U.S. Do they have multiple locations, or just the one by the Mall of America? They have twenty. No, I swear to God, twenty. So we've built, we've worked on the flooring. So it's like it's like usually forty thousand square feet is our scope, but we've done in the last. You know, consecutive years, we've done four new builds. And then last year we did like 10 renovations where you remove old flooring and right. install new flooring. It's all decorative, non-slip, but it's uh, it's fun because we get to travel. It's six of us guys, you know, we'll rent an Airbnb house and we have, you know, whether it's two weeks a week or a month, it's kind of our scope, but uh, it's turned into a huge piece of our company and I've kind of been in charge of that. And so my wife gets mad at me, but we're balancing that. But it's been a really cool part of our our company because it's uh, allowed us to retain guys and keep us working in the winter. Pick summer warm and bring your wife and your two-year-old with you. At the next one. So it's 2024 Naples, Florida. Okay. You hear that, uh, Mrs. Hicks? You're going to Florida. Yep. It'll be three. Yep. Um, okay. What... Um, I guess I, we're going to try this for the first time. I've never done rapid fire questions, but I kind of like them. So they're kind of fun. Yep. So let's go with uh, favorite business book. Favorite business book. Honestly, Mark, and I feel bad saying this, like I haven't read any yet. And I know the Carnegie book is good. I bought the Six Sigma book, but like yep. I haven't actually read them yet. So well, that's a fair answer. What? Yeah. How do you How do you self educate? I mean, you seem like a very motivated guy. You've got this amazing, amazing podcast, Audible. Like, what do you do that? <laughs> I, I do a lot of like just like article reading. Sure. Um, I know people like you know me. It's like a lot of googling stuff. I like you know when when you and your wife you get in bed at night and you pop on like a Netflix show. I'm pretty bad about sitting there on my phone for like 45 minutes just like reading stuff. Okay. You know, and it's like it's not. Not a book, but it's like, you know, general articles, uh, things like that. I'm yeah. not super tapped into like our industry where a lot of guys are on Facebook, you know, posting stuff or reading blogs. Um, not so much that, but I think just a lot of like business stuff. Like I, I read recently, it's like what happens when one of your high level executives tries to get poached from another company. And I'm just like, well, what do, what do other companies do? How do you prevent sure. that? Some guys sign that. So Not, it's more organic research. Now, that's a good answer. Yeah, and it's like you try to apply it to your field. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. What uh, your favorite source of information? Improving. Honestly, um, it's it's been podcasts lately. And me and Ian were talking about this, but like he told me one of your favorite podcasts. I listened a lot in the car. Um, but yeah, I think listening to someone talk for three hours, you can learn a lot, right? Yeah. And you can tune in and you can tune out and you can grab little pieces and um I, I just think it's great what people are doing with it now, mm -hmm. using their platform to educate people. Favorite quote? I, I, you're going to laugh at me. 
So <laughs> for those who aren't watching on the YouTube channel, he just pulled out like a out of his pocket. <laughs> it looks like a uh, a fortune cookie yeah. uh, inside. So, you know, because your company is growing. But so it's so uh, what's the word? Everyone's heard this, but it's like Rome was not built in a day. Be patient. So it's like, you know, a lot of times, you know, you're young, you're hungry, you're up and coming. You have a family. You feel like you're like you have to make all this money. You have to be successful. But, you know, a lot of really good companies take time to just grow organically, uh, you know, have good people integrated. But, like, there's no fast track to success. So I feel like, you know, having good relationships, working with people one day at a time. We look at projects like that where it's like, man, it's going to be bad. It's just like taking one day, one week at a time, you know. That's a really healthy outlook, especially in today's world where it, there seems to be, you know, you want this overnight success. What's your superpower? I think I, uh, we talked about this a lot. I think I can read people like pretty good. Like I can yeah. get a pretty good gauge on people, whether if they're a good person, if they're, you know, they're difficult. Sometimes I'll totally just miss, but I feel like, you know, you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room, but if you can be a good people person, communicate, diffuse situations and just be realistic. I think people uh, really trust people like that in our world. That's really a lot of how you can yeah. be successful. I would agree. Mm -hmm. uh, best advice you've ever been given. Uh, uh, you know when you when you get a, a bad nasty email and uh, you're like typing up the response and then you're like sleep on it. <laughs> yep, that's that is solid. That's solid marriage advice too. Oh my god, it's real, man. Like I had one. It was like a month ago, and like I called my wife and I ran her through the situation, and I was like, I showed her the email. She's like, don't send it. She's like, sleep on it. And the next day I woke up, deleted it. I was like, I'll let this ride out. The guy called and apologized. I was just like, you know, thank God. But it's like that is real applicable advice yeah especially in our world man like you know you get those emails sometimes and they're snarky and you're like well hold on you <laughs> yeah, know because your natural reaction i think that's another thing with like per such a personal thing that people often respond they you know they, they don't realize that you're a person too they yep. they view you as the business yep. and hey a business should be able to take anything yep. and they, they try to you know take the human out of it but mm -hmm. you know you have feelings too yep. oh, <laughs> you know we, 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 we care about what we do yeah, for sure and so especially uh, i mean like on big projects it's like stuff you work at these homes it's like you get your feelings hurt sometimes so it's like you Keep keep a business, keep professional. Yep. Don't ever let your emotions, I guess, convolute, you know, the job and you know the I guess the purpose of why you're there. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Well, thanks very much for coming on. Where can our listeners uh yep. tap into uh yourself and yeah, uh, yeah. concrete science? Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be on here. Uh along with you great. Um I'm really excited to listen to some of the other podcasts because I really appreciate people in construction. And uh yeah, don't be afraid to reach out and you can ask for me directly or we have plenty of good staff at our company, but uh, yeah, appreciate being on. Yeah, and uh, just for, and we'll be in the show notes, but we've got concretescience.com. Yep, it's at concrete-science.com. Um, yeah, we're uh, office in Minneapolis, office in Fort Myers for everyone that goes to Minnesota South in the in the winter. Minnesota so. South, that's yep. good. Yep. So, uh, any social platforms? Are you guys on LinkedIn or uh, Instagram or any of those? Yep. So we're on Instagram. Um, we don't get a lot of likes. I probably am the only one liking our photos, but uh, <laughs> not after this one. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I think uh, we're on our Facebook following is pretty good, and then. Um, we're all on LinkedIn. I made my production manager uh, or my uh, superintendent get on LinkedIn and he's like in this rabbit hole because it's everyone's on LinkedIn and it's cool, you know? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. But um, yeah, any platforms. And again, yeah, I just if, if you have a question and I'm pretty notorious, if you just want to talk or have ideas about things, I can sit and talk and we're not always looking for business. If you just want questions about our, our trade or what we do or, hey, I'm going to try this at home. You know, what do you think? You know, we're, we're, we're just regular people like everyone else in the industry, you know. That's awesome. Well, thanks for coming on, Chase. And yep. thanks for everyone for listening. If you like what you've heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. Uh, please share this episode or this show with anyone that you think might be interested in concrete or the concrete science directly. We really appreciate it. And a special shout out to Concrete Science. They're one of our sponsors uh, in this season. So thanks again for the support there as well. Yep. Yeah, appreciate it. Mark. Thanks, Chase. Yep.